Uh, good morning and afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Heath Houghton, the product manager for Autodesk CFD and some of our other simulation products. And I just wanted to say I'm happy that everybody is able to join and anybody who listens to the recording later, hope you gain some valuable insight into some of the upcoming changes for Autodesk CFD for our 2018 title year release. Uh, really, I'm only gonna cover two main topics. Um, and because one of them is is a big change for the product overall and that's how we're going to be approaching cloud solving uh, moving on 2018 and forward uh, and um, before i get into the presentation too heavily i just want everybody to realize that there is a blog post on our sim hub regarding some of the changes in 2018 and so if you need to go back and you want to read a lot of the things i wrote it'll be in the blog post but it also covers another change that we also have, and that's um, Advection Scheme 5 becoming the default. And I'll cover that first, uh, just because it's a shorter topic, and then we can dive in on the, on the changes on the cloud. But uh, basically, all of our technical staff, including our development and our technical support, have been telling me for the past couple of years that Advection Scheme 5 outperforms Advection Scheme 1 in basically every category, which is absolutely what we intended when we released it. But um, we're a little risk averse at times and we didn't want to change the defaults for the solver because that's found foundational onto what a lot of guys are doing when it comes to existing projects and stuff. But basically what we did for this year is we went ahead and made that logic change inside the software to say, if Advection Scheme 1 was the default in the past, that Advection Scheme 5 now is the default. It's a higher order solver and it's now the foundational solver for everything you do. Now, if you had a different advection scheme that was a default, we didn't change that. So advection scheme two, for instance, was the default for pumps. We didn't change it to ADV5, although uh, we definitely could have, and we might do that in the future, but we just want to make one change at a time. So this case, if it was ADV1 as the default in the past, um, except for a few certain instances, it will automatically change advection scheme five for everybody. Um, and that you won't really see much in the interface unless you go to the eviction options and you just happen to notice that eviction scheme five or the tooltips talk about it being the default. So that's one thing real quick to get out of the way, really minor UI differences there. Um, but the main thing I want to talk about is cloud solving in 2018 and we're going to a variable pricing model. So what does that mean? It really means that we're going to, in the software, predetermine the model complexity. So look at the solver options that you've selected, the size of the model, what kind of physics are you solving, all of that stuff, and tell, tell you ahead of time as a customer what that job will cost before submitting the job. Um, so it's a real simple tier rate right now. Um, if we determine that it's simple, we're actually reducing the price uh, for those jobs. And for moderate and complex jobs, uh, there's, a, there's a pricing tier up uh, as far as 30 to 100 cloud credits when we first start out. Now, what I will say is that this isn't just like a price increase. When we look at <clears throat> the jobs that were being submitted over the last several years, we've been at, up until this point saying we, no matter the job size or the complexity of it, we're gonna charge 15 cloud credits. And as our cloud services have evolved, we needed to make it a more sustainable, sustainable business model that would allow us to offer more services on the cloud. And just offering one price for everything wasn't gonna allow that. So what we decided to do was actually do a price reduction for the majority of simulations, but then allow for the more complex jobs that are solved on the, on the cloud for them to be sustainable from a, from a business perspective for us to be able to continue to offer them. And when I say that we're actually lowering the cost on the majority of simulations, I really mean it. So what happens is when we, we went ahead and did some samples and looked at historical data for uh, jobs that were submitted to the cloud by our customers, and under this pricing model, the majority of them, oh, in this case, 60%, showed up as simple and where you would actually receive a price reduction. And then a small, uh, like a third of them showed up as moderate and only a very small percentage, less than 10% showed up as complex. 
So for the majority of people, the majority of the simulations you run, you're going to see actually price reductions on the majority of your simulations. And then on a few of the other ones, you'll see a, a price increase. Um, just allows us, again, to offer more services in the future. And when I say more services in the future, it's not on this slide, but what we're, we'll be offering in this next quarter is CFT2 on the cloud as a premium cloud service. What does that mean? It means we'll be offering a service where we'll be throwing a ton of resources at the singular problem and allow you to solve on an order of magnitude faster. Um, and uh, doing this variable cloud cost is foundational to allow us to do that. So um, one other thing we're doing as well um, is a, an update to our policy on job cancellation. And so we're not changing the policy on jobs that don't give you any, any results back and don't give you any kind of um, answer as far as uh, downloaded answer. Like, so if you have a completed solve, we're gonna tell you ahead of time what will cost you. And then you can you make that at that, at that time a determination if, if it's the value is worth it to solve it on the cloud or just to solve it locally for free. Um, and for a completed solve, you get the full charge. For a failed solve under no matter what the circumstances, we have never charged and we will never charge for that. So if a solution has a bad setup or it diverges for whatever reason, it's a tricky solve, and it just doesn't give you a solve with downloaded results, we will not charge you. And that's, that's a continuation of our existing policy. Um, for a cancel solve, if you hit cancel in the job manager, uh, in the past there was no charge there, but we got, saw some odd user behavior, and um, we decided that uh, it'd be best if we did like a prorated charge. And when I say that, what I mean is it's, it's a very simple formula. We're just going to charge five cloud credits per hour up to the maximum of whatever a completed job would have solved. So if you, uh, if you saw, like I say, if you uh, had a medium complexity job, for instance, which is 30 cloud credits, and it solved for half an hour, that's five cloud credits. If you cancel it, if you let it run out it's, uh, and get the full downloaded results, obviously it's the whatever you agreed upon. But uh, if you solve it for two hours, then that's 10 cloud credits. If it solves for, and you can, then you cancel, and that's 10 cloud credits. If you solve for 20 hours, and then you cancel, it would still only be 30, 30 cloud credits. It wouldn't be 100 cloud credits, which, which would be a five hour rate, right? Um, so what I'm trying to say is that we're just going to prorate it up to a portion of what the completed job would have been. Um, that's a pretty simple change, but just want to be everybody to be aware of it. Um, and, by, and so again, this is all gonna be on the blog and in more detail, but I also wanna show what it looks like in the software so you can kind of get used to what the new dialogues will look like. So I have... Hey Heath, oh, while you take a, a little breather there. Um, can you give more guidelines of what really breaks down simple, moderate, and complex jobs? So yes. they have talking points in their own office or... or oh, exactly. Um, and and it, so these, as we um, sort for full awareness, uh, we are looking at the physics, the, the, the mesh estimate or the mesh, if you've already meshed it, so the model size, the physics, um, and how long the model is expected to run as far as how many iterations are. So a really long transit run would be with radiation and with, you know, maybe even compressibility, whatever, would be considered um, if the estimator goes through and looks at all the, the parameters and all the parameters add up to, wow, this is a really big job. It'll just call it out complex. Um, it just takes a lot to get to complex, by the way. Uh, and, and I'll show that here in a second. But for the majority of models, they're just simple. And we'll tell you ahead of time. So it's not like you have to guess at it. That's the big thing about this is that there's no, I'm going to submit a job and then, wow, I got a bill back later. We'll, we'll tell you exactly what we think ahead of time. And that's what, what the job costing is. So like, for instance, in this model, um, I'll show you what it looks like in the solver manager. I have a, a, a few different designs, a few different scenarios. The one thing that we will do in the software is 
tell you ahead of time about the, we wanna make sure everybody is fully informed about the changes. So we're gonna have an informational box anytime you go into one of the solver managers or the solve dialog about the uh, costing for canceled jobs to the job manager. Now, if, all you have to do is hit the yeah, I understand acknowledgement checkbox and that message won't show up again, but we're gonna show it every time. And I, I keep mine unchecked all the time just so I can show people that <laughs> the UI changes when I wanna do these webinars or talk to customers. Um, but when you go to the solver manager, uh, what you'll notice is for any time I have cloud, it'll actually tell me ahead of time what the cloud cost might be. Now, reality is, uh, for everybody watching this, th this model is typical model you might have for a flow control customer. And I have gone through and really uh, jacked up some of the physics. What I mean is ramped them up beyond what you would ever do typically on a valve in order to get these things to show 30 and 100 also, the, the moderate and complex jobs. Um, but it will tell you ahead of time, and like for instance for this one, it's my computer so obviously it doesn't matter. I hit cloud, it's gonna go through and show me you know, what the cloud cost might be. Now what we are also doing is we're trying to make it a little simpler for everybody so you understand the totality of, of what, what it's costing you on the cloud and, and what you have available to you as far as your account. Um, so if I were to submit all of these jobs, you know, it's gonna tell me down here in, this, in the dialogue how many cloud credits that would actually cost me uh, if they all ran to completion. And then also how many cloud credits I have on my account. So it's not just, it's all the available cloud credits at the aggregate sum of all the different contracts my company might have that I have access to. And that's controlled by your contract manager as far as which um, contracts that you as a user are linked to. But uh, for me, obviously I'm the product manager and I have, I have you know, several different accounts that I'm linked to so that I can, I can uh, properly show different things to different customers and different uh, tech support and everything else. But uh, anyway, I have a ton. Um, and that is my actual total. So yours might look a little different, but you'll be able to see what the impact is. So if you know it's gonna cost you 30 cloud credits to run three different scenarios and you have 10,000 cloud credits left, obviously it's minimal impact on what you're gonna have for the year. Um, so that's, that's that. Uh, and it's similar if I were just to go into the solve dialog for the individual scenario. So I actually have one that, again, I had specified as, as uh, as complex by changing the iteration. So I had told it to run, hey, this thing's gonna run 50,000 iterations. And I really super hyped up the mesh counts to make it look like a really massive model. Turned on physics like adaptation. And uh, if I hit solve, it'll go through and do a calculation of the cloud credits immediately. So as I change those settings, this will obviously update how many hit solve. So I haven't hit, when I hit solve, it hasn't gone and submitted it to the cloud yet. I have the option to cancel out of this right now, or I could submit it and say, yeah, 100 cloud credits, it's worth it, and I'll go. But again, like I would say, for all these models, unless I had messed with the physics, they would have been 10. I just wanna make that real clear that most jobs you'll see, it's gonna be 10 or 30, and a small percentage of really large ones will be the, the larger. So he, on this example right now, if you switch that to 500, what would it do? 500 iterations. Yeah. So let's look at that, right? So I'll change it to 500 and I'll turn off adaptation. So I'll lower the physics um, about it. Hit solve, 10 cloud credits. There you go. So, yeah, I mean, I made an order magnitude a lot more complex by saying a ridiculous amount of, you know, projected iterations. Uh, one question I have had re regarding that before is, you know, since we are looking at the iteration count, obviously, right? It's one of the, one of the, the items that we're looking at is if your practice is to, assume like 10 times the amount of iterations that you'd ever need for convergence. Um, and you're seeing that your projected uh, cost is, is higher than you, than you would expect the model to run. Don't try to under predict iteration count, but don't be ridiculous like I was with 50,000, right? I mean, this model probably converges in 250 iterations. Five, if it goes anything past 500, the pressure drop really isn't changing if it has some kind of a transient nature. I would say just, over predict like you have been, but not so drastically bad that, you, that you're that um, you making the estimator uh, think that the model's more complex than it is. Um, <clears throat> is that, I saw some questions flying by. Yeah, so 
let's say you set it to fifty thousand and it converges in two fifty. Yeah. Is and it only took an hour to solve. Right. You know, thinking of a, a new user that just doesn't really appreciate the cost of the cloud and just hit solve, mm -hmm. is it course correct for that or not? So we, we can't auto correct it within the software because it already has gone through the system. But we you know, obviously if um, if there are if there are jobs that I can make it even more extreme than that, right? Let's say you already solved it and you made a mistake. You hit solve again and it solves in, and it's a really big model, but it solves in three iterations, right? It auto converges because it, it's just, it the after going through a few iterations, the solver realizes that hey, this answer is not changing, it's already done. And so it solves very quickly. Uh, you, we have a make it right policy. I mean, that's basically what it is. And uh, that, that's our policy is that if, you, if there's something that's happening on the background that you noticed over time, that uh, you can call in and we'll, we can man do manual corrections, but it's a manual correction policy. But the reality is um, that there's no way to understand if something's gonna auto converge way faster than what you specify as far as your, your, your iteration. So we can't, in order to predictive operation and not just charge you per hour, that's the only drawback to that, that kind of a change. Okay. Yeah, I've seen questions. I just I don't want to expand my screen because then when I see the questions, it, it takes away half my screen for you guys that are watching online. Um, so that that is the major change is that we're going to this variable cloud costing, um, and like I said, it's not. I don't want anybody to think it's just like hey they're increasing the price because like I said, the majority of the jobs that are run on the cloud are actually, you know, a third cheaper. Um, and uh, it's just course correcting for the really large jobs so that we can offer premium services and it can be sustainable for us. Uh, otherwise, we'd have to start limiting the, the types of jobs you can solve in the cloud, which is totally against what we want to be doing. We want to make it easier to solve jobs and make it, it use the power of the cloud to expand your compute capacity and all that. And that gets to my point about CFD2. Having this kind of a strategy allows what we think is for, and I'll, I should call it cloud premium actually, but it's a, a premium cloud service uh, coming up in the next quarter where you will be able to solve with much more machine resources aimed at one problem or many different scenarios. You could have that same cloud service you know, aimed at all of them and have a much faster solve times, allow you to attempt even larger models than you could ever attempt on your own machine. Um, so that's where we're at with cloud pricing and, um, yeah, that's basically it. I can talk a little bit about futures or we can answer more questions. Um, but this is the major change I wanted to talk about. Now, if there are any more questions, we can continue to go through it, but, um, it's, it's pretty simple on the UI. It's, but I just want to make sure everybody was aware so that, they're not caught off guard. That's the last thing we want to do. So, as you see with this job, when I update that one physics to make the model more realistic, I get the 10, 10, 30 look. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then I will talk a little bit about futures. I don't normally do that, but uh, in this case, I wanted to just give everybody a little bit of a, a taste of where we're going with the direction. So what we're trying to do from a development goal is just reduce CFD simulation time. And that means the solve time, it means total time you're spending getting from point A to point B your answers. Um, so Short-term lingo, CFD2 is our distributed memory solver. It will eventually take over as our standard solver. Um, it doesn't have all of the physics that our, our um, standard solver has, but it has a distributed memory capability, which means we can throw many, many compute nodes, um, in this case on the cloud, uh, at, the, at the problem, so it can drastically uh, reduce that, that solve time. And we'll, when we offer the service, I'll have some some more pertinent examples and I'll do another webinar, but um, 
about the about the premium cloud service, but it really what it's going to do is about an order of magnitude faster for for all the problems that you solve that that are worthy of that service. Like you wouldn't solve the real simple ones on on the distributed memory solver, but the the larger models you would, the ones that take a day, two days. Suddenly, a a two day model can become a two hour model, um, or a or well, a two day model can become a four hour model is what we would expect. And so that is what uh, what we think is a is a huge premium when you something might take you a few days and maybe run through the end of the week and you'll get it after the weekend so that you can get it the same morning. I mean, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, but the one thing that we are, that's not being released anytime soon uh, as far as in the immediate you know coming quarter, but hoping to offer some uh, functionality this year. Uh, and I don't mean in CFT 2019, but in this year, but it's under uh, technical development, which means that I can't have an exact timeline. Uh, is that we're offering, hoping to really drastically cut down on the man hour time when it comes to model meshing and simplification. Um, so we want to develop a geometry transformation functionality. It's a really complex term, but it's, uh, basically we want to offer some kind of functionality in the software uh, that'll do uh, this. And that is take a model that has the basic form that you want, but has a lot of complexity because it's a manufacturing model and not a simulation model. We want to reduce that geometry simplification down to one, less than an hour, and that's our that's our goal uh, for the service. and And hopefully, in most cases, be just totally automatic, which means man hour time is really nothing. Um, but uh, we want to transform them. So this is actual tech we have in house right now, but it's not commercially ready. But where we can take something that has all this sheet metal, and you can't see all the details, but I try to give a view where you can see. You know, there's a sheet metal gap here, sheet metal gap there. There's all this little cover panel, this screw and, and, and gaps, and that it converts that geometry into something that's usable for CFD simulations, closes up all the little tiny unnecessary details and features, but, you know, leaves um, all the major things like this handle has a really funky um, light weighting design and it's still all fully captured. So that's... Uh, that's what we want to be offering, and that's where we're going to be putting a lot of efforts. That and increasing the physics of that premium cloud service where it, it can eventually handle every single model um, that you would have solved in the standard uh, cloud service. So that's that's where we're going to be sending a lot of a lot of resources over the next um, several development cycles. Hey Heath, maybe talk about um, Kind of changes within Autodesk in terms of product release schedules and, and goals. Yeah, so that, that's the reason I'm talking this future. I usually don't talk futures at all. Um, the reason I'm talking about that is because the the goals for us are to offer our subscription customers continued value over the year and not have these huge releases um, that are like every title year is, is actually all the new features. So we're going to change the title years every year and at about the same schedule, um, you know, 2018, 2019, all of that. But instead of just doing bug fixes throughout the year, which is what we have been doing. Um, so basically if you had, we wouldn't be, we weren't able to because of the business model that we had and, and legal um, revenue recognition, all this kind of stuff. We weren't able to re release new features uh, in and a product update only could we do that in in the uh, releases. What we're going to be doing now, because of the way we offer our services as a, as a subscription, we can now start offering new features. And that's what we plan on doing is every quarter um, or whenever a new feature becomes commercially viable is just offer it in a product update. And that's why we'll be able to offer the premium cloud service in the next quarter and not have to wait till next year. That's why whenever this functionality becomes available for a large enough set of models and commercially viable, we'll offer it in a product update. Um, so the second that this, I think is commercially viable for internal flows, it'll be offered. Uh, so that, so all of our flow control customers, valve customers, all those guys um, can utilize this functionality to really reduce the amount of knowledge uh, from a CAD perspective and a lot reduced from a, the time spent on models um, into the into the software. Uh, 
I know there are a lot of questions. I, I, I'm really tempted to just expand the question panel. I can see it flashing like crazy. I'll, yeah, try so to answer a couple I'll go for it, Royce. Um, someone was asking about new functionality added to CFD2. Um, mm -hmm. I know year over year we've been adding functionality, but if you want to mm -hmm. touch on that. Right. So what we what we have targeted, we already have basically if you have internal flow that's com incompressible, CFD2 could already solve that. And it could solve thermal. We, you know, we added transient, we added radiation to the thermal. So we're adding more and more functionality um, when it comes to that. Still missing a couple of, of thermal items, which we're working on. Um, so I want to first complete basically all of the electronics material models. Um, so what it's lacking right now, really for electronics is the compact thermal model and the um, uh, like the Peltier uh, heaters and all that kind of stuff, or the Peltier devices. Um, once we have those, basically all of our electronic suite you can run because you already can run fans and, and uh, resistance regions. Um, the next set of functionality we'll be targeting is to complete out, I think, it, it kind of it, everything, by the way, when you're doing this, CFT2, this distributed memory solver, it's a complete rewrite. It's not just like a small um, thing. And some, some items are more uh, scalable than others. So what we will do from then is we get rid of all the electronics or get, get them completed. And then the AEC stuff has been coming along the way. So when I say AEC, I mean your thermal comfort, all of the stuff you would do in architecture, engineering, construction is, is coming along the way. We'll have to add a couple of pieces of functionality once all the electronics is done to finish out the AEC. And then at that point, we're attacking like the other large stuff, like, like we would start looking into motion. There, the schedule is, I have a set schedule, but it, it can become fluid based on what I see as the customer need when I'm looking at um, types of jobs that people are trying to, to solve more often that are running longer. Um, but uh, that's that's the, the schedule we're working on is, is opportunistically taking them on because you can't get it all done at once. But for this year, I'll reiterate. So we added radiation, which was a huge thing because it's highly nonlinear and the transient is there. And, and we added um, like the heatsink device for, for electronics is, is coming along. So all those things are starting to come on. The other thing we did in the software, I don't know if anybody noticed it uh, in the past, uh, the solver would tell you with basically uh, almost like it looks like an error message. And that was, that was early last year. It would do that and it would tell you, oh, no, you can't run CFT2. Um, what happens now is the interface actually just intercepts that. Before you go through the process of starting the solve, it'll say, oh, no, you, this, these two things are not um, compatible with CFT2 at the time. If, if uh, you have something in there, it'll tell you what they are. So you can... Um, Either like if it's a compact thermal model, for instance, change it to a silicon device and and just you know run it old school that way, or decide you want to run it with the standard solver. So Heath, any updates? like a robust and versatile surface wrapper and thin mesh or like the other competitors offer. Um, yeah, so that's what, yeah, right. I, I appreciate that because it's exactly what we're trying to go for is um, for our geometry, the surface wrapper that's in there right now, it's really for external flow. And we learned a lot. And I honestly will just say that it, it doesn't address a lot of the customer model because external flow isn't the majority of what our customer models are. Um, so what we have is underlying technology that hasn't been commercially viable yet. I wish it was because we've been working pretty hard behind the scenes, even though the, re the features aren't evident in the software yet. The technology that we're working on is um, for us, and we just haven't, we're you know, just a couple of steps away. But like this right here, that's a surface wrap. That's not our mesh. That's a surface wrap that healed all the geometry here. It's just not the one that's available in the software today. Um, because what we're going to do is make sure it's completely robust and move forward once that we feel that 
internal flow capabilities are, are fully viable, we'll release it. And that's why, I'm, that's why I offered it as a, an, um, an image of what we are working towards. This is our major goal. This and CFT2 are our major goals. So um, there are obviously other things, you know, you want to make sure that software, if there's anything that is from a user experience standpoint, less attractive. You want to take care of those as you can. But, but these are the two major things, this and CFT2. So to get back to it, uh, because this is our this is our overall development goal that we've said. It's just reduce this simulation time. That's man hour, and CFT one will be replaced eventually by CFT two completely. So shrink all that, make our simulation easy. Should make everybody happier and more productive. Are there any other questions? I just had one come in. Um, any special meshing tools for thin parts or plates, some sort of thin mesher? Yeah, so thin mesher, I don't, um, we obviously can mesh uh, surfaces with a surface uh, part. Um, like a, if you have an interface between two parts, we have that ability right now is, is um, it will do what we call a surface mesh only on, on those parts. But I, I would have to see what you're talking about. There's no added functionality, thin mesher specifically. Um, I would have to understand that a little bit better to give a better, more complete answer. I would say that as you have really thin parts um, moving forward, our geometry transformation service would, would hopefully address that. Right. And that's one of the things we're looking at is um, when it, even model just, made out of surface parts that does it on a volume model uh, like um, I don't know built in uh, Google SketchUp or something like that which is all surfaces and no no volumes um, that the surface measures should be able to, to handle those types of models or the geometry transformation service or function should be able to take care of those and make them a viable model Just had another question come in about free surface flow um, mm -hmm. uh, enhancements, you know, especially yeah. around really large areas like rivers and things like that. Yeah, we haven't we haven't addressed that. Um, it's in the software commercially. Um, the, the the thing with free surface is that you know it takes a lot of mesh, and so it's just they take their long run times. Um, I have my ideas on what we could do, uh, to have them. We've been looking at different technology as far as changing the way we solve free surface. Um, but we haven't implemented anything yet. Uh, so for, for like those really large rivers and things like that, uh, I think a change in technology as far as the way we solve them might help. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't want to talk too much because we don't have anything that we're planning on releasing anytime soon. Is there a way to model 1D cooling channels with rod type elements within a solid block? Hmm. That's interesting. So, um, 1D rod type to the solid rod. Right. No, not today. We don't, we don't, um, we don't have link elements in the software. 
uh, one thing we've been talking about, and this is, again, this is all future, so it doesn't exist in the software, but we have technology at Autodesk that's, uh, it's called, we, for a while there, it was on lab, it was called Project Dalton, which is basically a 1D fluid solver, piping networks. Um, so we're talking about, in the future, integrating that technology into the current CFD platform to where you could have 1D and 3D. Um, I have to go into the specifics with the customer. Maybe you can take their name down or we can make sure we get their name uh, to understand exactly, to understand if that would, uh, exactly what their uh, modeling scenarios, to understand if uh, what we were planning on doing uh, would would tackle their problem or not. But um, I will try to get your name down. I think the questions are logged, right, Royce? Yeah, we got all the records. Okay, cool. So that's what I mean. So in, in that case, we don't have it in the software now. Um, we're talking about planning some 1D integration, uh, which in my mind on a larger scale would, would uh, help with like piping networks where you have also um, components that need individual analyses within that piping network and have that all linked. We're talking about doing stuff like that. But uh, 1D uh, rods are, are not there just yet. And I, I, I need to go back and, and check to see exactly what that is to um, understand if the integration we're talking about would solve that or not. Yeah, so Heath, I sent you the contact information for that one. Yeah. Um, I think we'll leave this to the last question. And this is this is also going to like sort of future thinking and mm -hmm. how, much, how far we're going. Um, really, it's on manual coupling between solid and fluid parts of the simulation. Manual um, coupling. I'm not exactly sure what type of coupling, if we're really talking FSI or if we're um, so you want to expand on that, unless Heath, you know what they're trying to get at. He didn't say for thermal, right? He was talking about Temperature coupling. So I'm not sure what manual coupling would be. Like maybe. Uh, I don't know. So I, I think we can talk about the way that I could talk about the way that solids and fluids are interacting today in our software, and and basically it's automatically that a, a fluid is going to be interacting thermally with the solid. You can alter the way that it's interacting by putting in a contact resistance or a thermal resistance on the surface of the solids, which would, you could basically insulate it from the fluid if you wanted. Uh, uh, wait, I got, I got some extra here for you. So it's really actually getting down to the solver levels. It's a bit more in the weeds, you know, and he's really asking about regulating the number of iterations in solid and fluid and how the data exchange between them. And, um, yeah, I, I see where he's going now, but oh yeah, maybe address yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know if we want to. <laughs> it sounds, I, I, yeah, I don't want to go into that much. I, I think the solvers are optimized for thermal problems. I mean, they don't. They actually are. We're an iterative solver. Um, uh, we've looked at fully coupled before, um, depending, and it, and it all comes down to us what solves faster. Uh, overall wall clock time. Yeah. So that's where we're at. Yeah. It, right. I don't think there's any control between the number of iterations at all between fluid and solid. It's all solved at the same time. It is solved at the same time. And yeah. they have their own time steps. As a matter of fact, in, you know, when you're solving a, an actual steady state problem, they do their own time steps mm -hmm. um, for thermal and for the solids because you don't want them on the same time scale. It would take forever for the solid portion. Uh, right. But, uh, and there are some flags in the background where you can control like the time stepping for the solid and all that. Mm -hmm. But getting into all that, I think is a little bit too much right now. We uh, yeah. we're probably a technical support um, yeah. detail item. If there's something that they're trying to solve that's not working correctly for them or not working fast enough, we can help them optimize it. But uh, for me, solving technology, we're always looking at new solving technology. Um, as we, like I said, CFT2 is being rewritten 
we're always looking at, well, how can we reduce wall clock time as well as iteration, iteration. Uh, so we look at a couple of solvers all the time. We look at, for instance, one thing I didn't mention was like, when we're gonna do incompress, I mean, compressible with CFD2. Uh, the real question is, we'll probably rewrite compressibility for CFT2 because it has to be rewritten anyway. We'll probably even change the, the algorithm completely. Um, so that always happens. So as CFT2, uh, you see physics expand, realize that it's not just a, a port of some code from the standard solver. It's a complete rewrite and, and relook at that type of functionality as we go. Just want everybody to kind of realize that, <laughs> that it's, it's, um, it's our opportunity every time we do that to foundationally change um, the solver if we want, if we feel like it's, if it's uh, needed. But um, yeah, I think for everybody that, if you have any questions about the variable cloud, you know, obviously you can contact me, contact our support folks. Um, I, like I said, I put a blog post about the uh, variable cloud cost and ADB5 and how that has changed a little bit. Um, and obviously in our release notes, there's there's some change you know, that it's detailed out there as well. Great, thanks so much, Heath. Um, and I think with that, we'll go ahead and um, bring this webinar to an end today. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.